Thank you. A decision in the appeal of a landmark case is due this morning, which could have implications for more than a million workers. The cab hailing company Uber appealed against a ruling that says its drivers are workers entitled to a range of benefits, including paid holidays and the national minimum wage, rather than self-employed. Well, the case was originally brought to an employment tribunal by two of its drivers last year. It has implications for more than a million people employed in the so-called gig economy. Uber maintains its drivers are independent contractors and that the overwhelming majority want to keep the freedom of being their own boss. Well, we first broke the news of a group of Uber drivers' intention to take the company to court back in 2015. Here's a clip from Jim Reed's original report where he spoke to James Farrar, one of the drivers who brought the case and to one of Uber's bosses. You know, my average net uh, in July was five or three an hour, well below minimum wage. So if you want to cover your costs um, and keep the family afloat, you've got to work a lot, a lot of hours. But at the end of the day, it's your choice, right? I mean, you don't have to work for Uber. You could work for someone else, get another job. Yeah, it's true. But, you know, Uber is, has so aggressively come into the market. I think those opportunities to work for other operators are, are, are rapidly evaporating. James and the other drivers involved in the legal action say the way Uber operates means they're not really self-employed entrepreneurs at all, but working for the company, and so should get the rights that go with it. The flexibility. 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 Being able to log on and log off as I please. You can choose the hours. It is only a small number taking legal action, and there will, of course, be many happy Uber drivers, as the company points out in its marketing. You can work whenever you want. The money is going directly into my account. At Uber's new headquarters in a skyscraper in London, the boss says this new way of working is all about choice. Many of our drivers have moved from traditional jobs where they had to work prescribed shifts and certain number of hours a week and it was difficult to take time off. And they've chosen to work with Uber because of that flexibility. The fact that you can work literally whenever you want, that's the flexibility that the majority of Uber drivers are really looking for. But can you have that flexibility and have rights like holiday pay and the minimum wage? Looking at what drivers take home is something that we look at very, very carefully. Um, what we find is that most of the drivers um, using the app actually take home around 15 or 16 pounds an hour. Obviously, their costs vary hugely depending on whether they rent or own and, and a number of other factors. But, but the majority of them are actually making around 10 or 12 pounds an hour, even after those costs. Is there a danger here that Uber as a company sort of wants to have its cake and eat it. You want to treat these drivers as self-employed entrepreneurs, but on the other hand, you want to tell them exactly what to do. Uber drivers are completely free to, to work whenever and wherever they, wherever they want, so long as they live up to the quality standards on the, on the platform. Well, earlier I spoke to James Farrar, the Uber driver who brought the driver's rights case against the firm, Olivia Dobby, a barrister and employment law specialist, and Emma, who drives for Uber and thinks the driver should not be receiving employee benefits. James, you won the tribunal last year. How worried are you about the outcome of this appeal? Well, I'm naturally concerned. I'm anxious to hear what happens today. But in general, I'm optimistic. You know, I think... The law is on our side, natural justice on, is on our side, and, you know, have to be a little bit mad to take on a $70 billion corporation, and we're very lucky to have the backing of our, of our union, the IWGB, to do that. Um, but I think we're going, to, um, we're going to win, but we're up against it. We're up against a, an army of lawyers, an army of PR consultants, an army of lobbyists. Um, but I think we'll prevail because the law's on our side. Uh, like you say, you're one of two drivers who decided to take this action in the first place, taking on a company worth more than, like you say, $60 billion. How confident were you at the time? Well, I mean, it, you know, the decision to take them on was over um, more direct uh, matters at hand. Two things, really. Uh, earnings. Uh, if we do the numbers for a second, Uber say that the top drivers, the top drivers now, and they publish this, earn 18 pounds an hour. If you break that down after commission, that's 13, 15 hours. So every hour I work, Uber earns 450 no matter what. But for me, at that level of earnings, that comes out to 650 pounds a week. I've always got 400 pounds a week to cover. So it's about 200 to 250 a week for the vehicle and, and the insurance. 
150, uh, 100 to 150 for, for fuel. That leaves you earning about five pounds an hour. So what difference would it make if you were considered an employee instead of self-employed? Well, I am self-employed and the case isn't about be, be, becoming an employee. It's about um, being a worker, a self-employed worker with special protections to earn at least the minimum wage. Um, and to have holiday That's pay. a key distinction, isn't it? Because if you're an employee, you get workers' rights like sick pay, holiday pay and the minimum wage. Uh, Emma, I want to bring you in. You're an Uber driver. Do you not want to be paid minimum wage, get sick pay, holiday um, pay? Well, I, I, I earn more than minimum wage. I, I, I do earn about £18 an hour um, after they take their commission. Um, it, is, it is a bit of a potluck thing on sort of how lucky... You, you know, what jobs you get, but I kind of quite like that. You know, sometimes you get loads of little jobs, sometimes bigger jobs, and uh, I, I, I'm not really sure. You know, I agree with so much that James says. However, I'm quite, I'm quite happy to be self-employed. So, and I'm part of, I pay two pounds a week to have sickness benefit um, with a partner of Uber's, Ipsa. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what there is of the advantage with minimum wage. I don't. I don't really understand, to be Olivia, honest. Olivia, what could this appeal mean for the gig economy, not just for Uber? Um, well, I think a really important distinction to tease out, and I think a little bit of confusion has come across even in this panel, if I may say so, is the distinction in law between a self-employed contractor and employee, which are at one end of the spectrum, and this intermediate category of what we call a worker. Now, the Uber decision that came out last year did not find that Uber drivers are employees, which would be quite a striking finding. It simply found that they are workers, which is this an intermediate category, which means they're entitled to a basic minimum floor of employment protection rights. Those rights include the right to paid holiday, um, minimum rest breaks and national minimum wage. So how's that different to an employee? An employee has a higher level of protection, so unfair dismissal, protection against redundancy and, and other rights as well. So we, if, if I can describe it really as a spectrum, you've got the self-employed contractors on the one end who are entirely running their own business, you've got the employees at the other end who benefit from the full protection of employment law rights, and then workers in the middle who have a sort of minimum bundle of rights, and that includes minimum wage and paid time off for holiday. Um, and so the decision last year didn't mean that Uber drivers are entitled to protection for unfair dismissal or redundancy pay, and it equally doesn't mean that Uber can control them day to day. As workers, they still retain a high degree of flexibility to reject work, not log on to the app if they don't want to. Um, but when they do, for time that they spend um, at work, they will be accruing holiday, pay for holiday, which they can take at a later date. So I think a bit of confusion has arisen as to what the implications of the decision last year actually are. Um, the appeal, of course, was heard uh, at the back end of September. The decision's coming out this morning. Um, and that was Uber challenging the finding even that the drivers are workers. Why? Well, there's a cost for Uber. Obviously, if they have to pay holiday pay, that's going to um, increase the costs of what they have to pay the drivers. Um, there'll be an actual physical cost in money terms, but also an administrative cost in trying to work out what holiday to pay each worker um, and then actually having to pay that holiday. So there's a clear business reason why they wouldn't want to do that. Um, and I can only think that that would be the, the, the prime reason. I understand Uber has suggested that um, the majority, or if not all of their drivers, get more than minimum wage anyway. I don't know how accurate that is. I haven't looked at the data. But, uh, but I understand some people challenge that. Um, and if that's the case, and there'd be additional cost as well if they're required to guarantee minimum wage. Their Which driver. way do you think the appeal will go? Um, I, I'd be surprised if Uber was successful. And I say that because there, there seems to be a trend of cases coming through at the moment with similar sorts of scenarios where um, workers in the gig economy, so couriers, drivers um, and delivery people, for example, are being recognised as having this basic minimum floor of employment rights as being workers in law. Um, and I think that uh, I'd be quite surprised if Uber succeed. If they fail, what will the implications be for other workers working in the gig economy? Well, each decision, any legal decision, is about the people that brought the decision. So it is going to be exclusive to the claimants in that case. 
it will, of course, have a wider political impact, perhaps, um, a political with a small p. We might get other companies recognising that the way they run their platform is markedly similar to what we have in Uber. So they might start to choose to give their workers, uh, identify them as workers and give them employment protection rights. Um, but ultimately, it is only about those who brought the case and the decision is only binding on those. OK, so... Emma, we've got a bit of context now from Olivia. If, <coughs> as Olivia says, you can still choose when you work, choose which jobs to accept, but you also get the benefits of things like uh, sick pay uh, and a guarantee with your wages, what, what's the harm in that? Um, because I think, I think I'd be tied in more. Um, there, there are other, other platforms out there, there are other uh, companies out there that you can work for where you can get some regular routine, you know what you're getting... Um, that's not what I signed up to Uber for. I understood what I was signing for. What you know, it, there was it was attractive to me because I didn't know where I was going when I was picking a passenger up. It's quite an adventure. I like people. I like driving. Um, I I I'm not sure the advantages. I'm not I'm not really understanding what those are. Even 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 with this whole wonderful explanation. Um, I just feel that I would be tied in more uh, and it, the impact of, of greater administration costs is going to, I feel, come back on us or the passengers at some point somehow. James, can you understand how Emma feels? I, I can, but let me <coughs> tell you a different story. Um, one of our court claimants, a good friend of mine in, involved in this case, has a child who's very, very sick in Great Ormond Street Hospital. The family's almost residential there um, during the child's illness. He has to make the payments on his vehicle every week, whether he's working or not. Um, for him to have paid holidays, for him to be guaranteed minimum wage when he does work, would mean so, so much for that family in terms of, of, of social security and, and security for that family. So I can understand that Emma may not want these rights, but other people desperately need them. What about the impact on prices? Because... When you're talking about the business model, if Uber is going to have to pay more to cover those extra things, that could then, it probably would, have a knock-on effect of driving up the cost prices for customers. Olivia? I, I think that's likely. I don't know how they'll manage to <coughs> subsume the cost within their business model. It may be... Um, you know, that they take slightly less profit from each driver in order to absorb a bit of the cost themselves. But I highly anticipate that ultimately there'll have to be an increase in price for the customer. I think it's realistic. In reality, you know, um, some analysis has been done that really the, at, at present fares, the customer's only paying about 60% of the true cost. The reality is that there's a lot of venture capital money has been put into this. For companies like Uber to literally acquire the market, through referral bonuses and, and so on. So the, f the fares are unrealistically low at the moment. If someone's used to paying a fiver to get from A to yeah. B, they're, yeah. they're not going to want that's to true, pay but, more. And, and that's, that's true, but, we're, well, we're, the problem with that is, is that we're, we're bus ridership is at the lowest it's been in 10 years in London. We're pulling people off the public transportation system. Congestion is up. Air quality is the worst it's been in London. We can't run a public transportation so system. Do you think the public cars. would be willing to pay more if they knew it meant better rights for workers? Oh, I'm certain they would. I'm absolutely. Final say from you, Emma. Oh gosh, where to where to begin? You know, there's a reason why the the, the buses are empty. Uh, women, you know, contrary to this sort of aggressive uh, attack by London cabs uh, at the moment against Uber, women feel safer in Ubers, That's true. not on public transport. You know, there is no protection for us on public transport. You know, you get assaulted on buses, on trains. TfL aren't addressing that. That's, That's it, in your opinion, because we can't well, speak okay. for all women. OK, but, but I'm, I'm listening to a lot of women, talking right. to a lot of women. I have a lot of passengers talking to me about it. I feel very strongly about it. And also, I have been supported through all my work at Grenfell over the past five and a half months. Um, so I, I too, um, need, you know, uh, look to self-employment and being supported by Uber, which they've done amazingly, um, as well as, you, you know, you, you telling the story. I'm really sorry to hear about that driver with a child mm. in Great Ormond Street, but, you know, we, we're all working against something, mm. um, and, and I haven't found fault with Uber in the support they've given me and the car company that I rent from. OK, we'll no. have to leave it there. Emma, Olivia, James, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. Thank you.